Yellowstone by S. J. Teller. Narrated by Dave Gillis. This is a work of fiction. Names, characters, businesses, places, events, and incidents are either the products of the author's imagination or used in a fictitious manner. Any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, or actual events is purely coincidental. Copyright 2019 by S. J. Teller. All rights reserved. The living room is dimly illuminated by the glow from the television. Ben sits on the floor in a cross-legged position, gazing at the disturbing images unfolding on screen. A 3D computer model shows a massive magma chamber below the surface of the Earth. Wyoming and the adjoining states of Montana to the north and Idaho to the west will bear the full destructive force of the initial eruption, says the narrator. The model animates to show the magma being violently ejected onto the Earth's surface. Billions of tons of molten rock will be ejected from the enormous magma chamber beneath Yellowstone, annihilating anything and everything within a 100-mile radius of the National Park. At least two-thirds of North America will be smothered with a thick layer of volcanic ash which, together with the toxic gas released, will cause colossal devastation. The effects of the eruption will not be felt by the rest of the world until hours or even days later. The simulation changes to show ash being swept around the globe. This is when the ash will have dispersed into the atmosphere, blocking out much of the sunlight and plunging the earth into a volcanic winter on a scale completely unprecedented in human history. The immediate consequences will be the inevitable collapse of agriculture and contamination of water supplies, resulting in widespread disease and starvation. Lisa enters the living room. Hey, she says, I've told you before about watching this stuff. She strides over to the television and switches it off. Come on, get up. Your dad's here. A smile lights up Ben's face. He quickly gets to his feet and runs out of the room. In the kitchen, Charlotte leans against the kitchen counter while Gary makes cups of tea. So how's it going, love? Gary asks. Miss being at school? Your mum tells me you were top of all your classes. Charlotte nods modestly. I miss my friends, mostly. Well, you can still see them, can't you? I'll give you a lift if you need one. What about your friend down the road? Kimberly, is it? You two used to be joined at the hip. I don't see her that much these days. Oh, how come? We just kind of drifted apart. Yeah, it happens. I'm not in touch with any of my old schoolmates. Although I did bump into a bloke the other day who I hadn't seen for about twenty years. We were drinking buddies before I met your mum. Crazy he was. Never thought he'd see thirty. Turns out he only lives about three streets away from where I'm staying now. He's got a young family too. It's funny how things turn out. Gary hands a cup of tea to Charlotte. Here you go, Pix. No sugar. You're sweet enough. Thanks, Charlotte says, taking the cup from Gary. Oh, sorry, love. I bet no one calls you that anymore, do they? Not for a long time. Sorry, pet. Old habits die hard, you know. It's okay. So, what do we call you these days? Just Charlotte. Mum still calls me Lottie sometimes, but I prefer Charlotte. Well, Charlotte it is then. Just hit me every time I forget. It'll soon sink in. Not too hard, like. I'm an old man now. Charlotte smiles. Gary and Charlotte enter the dining room together, carrying the cups of tea. Charlotte takes a seat at the dining table as Ben rushes in, carrying a trophy. Dad, he says to Gary, look what I won. All right, big man. What you got there? Gary asks as he puts the teacups down onto the table. Ben hands him the trophy. I won on Saturday. I beat two boys who were older than me too. One was ten and the other was eleven. Bloody hell. Good going, kid, Gary says as he turns to Charlotte. I think we've got the next Bruce Lee here. What do you say? Or is it Jean-Claude Van Damme? Bruce Lee, shouts Ben. Gary hands the trophy back to him. 
Well done, kid. That's fantastic. Lisa enters the dining room carrying Evie, who's rubbing her tired eyes. She sits Evie in a chair at the table. Right, says Lisa. I think that's everyone. Gary hands her a teacup. Here's your tea, Lise. Oh, thanks. Right, take a seat, everyone, instructs Gary. It's time for the big opening. Gary, Lisa and Ben join Charlotte and Evie at the dining table. Gary takes an unopened envelope out of his jacket pocket. I can't believe you haven't opened it yet, says Lisa. Hey, we agreed we'd open it when we're all together. I'm a man of my word, me. So, is everyone here? Hold on, where's Evie gone? asks Gary, looking around. I'm here, she says. Has anyone seen Evie? Gary asks, pretending he can't see or hear her, even though she's sitting right next to him. We can't open this without her. He looks underneath the table. Dad, I'm here. Ben, have you seen your sister anywhere? She was here a minute ago. I'm sure she was. Nope, Ben replies. Lisa and Charlotte smile. What about you, pet? Gary asks Charlotte. Have you seen your sister? Can't say I have, she replies, playing along. Have you checked under the newspaper? asks Lisa. She might be under there. Oh, good idea, says Gary, lifting up the newspaper that's lying on the table in front of him. No, she's not under there. Evie pulls hard on Gary's arm. I'm here, Dad. I'm right next to you. Oh, there you are, pet. We've been looking for you everywhere. I've been here the whole time, Evie insists. Oh, sorry, love. We didn't see you. Lisa, Charlotte and Ben begin to laugh. Right, says Gary. Now that we're all here, it's the moment we've all been waiting for. Drum roll, please. Ben does a drum roll with his fingers on the table. Remember, says Lisa, we have less than a 0.001% chance of being selected, so don't get your hopes up. It's almost certainly going to say we've not been chosen. Oh, listen to Mrs. Optimistic here, Gary says sarcastically. I just don't want everyone getting their hopes up and then being disappointed. That's all. Just open it, says Charlotte. Yeah, agrees Ben. Come on, open it. Open it, chimes in Evie. Okay, okay, Gary says. Keep your hair on. Right, here goes. Gary opens the envelope, takes out a letter and begins reading it aloud. Dear Mr. Graham, we are very sorry to inform you that you and your family have not been selected in the lottery to take residence in the deep underground safety bunkers. However, we have prepared an exhaustive online resource to help you cope as best as possible with the difficult times ahead. Gary lays the letter down on the table. Ah, well, that's that then. Sorry, kids. It's not your fault, says Charlotte, just as Ben bursts into tears. Hey, don't worry, kid, Gary says, trying his best to console him. It doesn't mean we're done for. It just means we'll have to work a bit harder than those pansies in the bunkers. That's all. Lisa gets up from her seat. She walks around to Ben and hugs him tightly. Hey, come on, babe, she says, kissing him on the cheek. It's okay. We've got our own bunker, remember? Yeah, says Gary. Your mum's got enough supplies in that basement to last us a decade. The government will be coming to us for help before long. It's okay, Ben, says Evie. We don't need the pansy bunker. Lisa looks at Gary, clearly not amused. Sorry, love, he whispers before turning to Evie. That's the spirit, pet. But you shouldn't use the P word. Pansy, asks Evie. Is it a swear word? Not exactly, pet. You just shouldn't use it like I do. Charlotte gets up from the table. Come on, Eves, she says. Time for Betty Bose. She takes Evie's hand and helps her down off the chair. Thanks, Pex. I mean, Charlotte, says Gary, quickly correcting himself. Night, night, love, he says to Evie. I'll see you tomorrow. Night, night, Evie responds, yawning. Night, pet, says Lisa. I'll come up and tuck you in shortly. Evie and Charlotte leave the room. Ben wipes his eyes. I think it's bedtime for us all, Lisa says to Ben. What do you reckon? Want tucked in? No, I can do it myself, Ben replies as he gets up from the table. 
He looks at Gary. Are you coming back tomorrow? Course I am, kid. We'll all go down to Bits Park, have a kick around with the ball. Ben smiles and then leaves the room. Night, gorgeous, Lisa shouts after him. She sits back down at the table with Gary. You will come back and take him to the park tomorrow, won't you? Yeah, of course I will. Because he'll take that as a promise, you know. I don't want him to be disappointed. Lise, I'll keep my word, I swear. I'll come back first thing in the morning and we can all go down together, have a picnic or something. Sorry, it's just that... I know. I haven't been too good at keeping promises in the past, have I? Well, there was certainly room for improvement. That's putting it nicely, admits Gary. Lisa smiles. It's late. Gary rinses out a teacup in the sink and then slams it down onto the worktop just as Lisa enters the kitchen. Careful, she says. I find cups work better when they're in one piece. Sorry, Gary replies, rinsing out another cup. It's not your fault, you know. There were only a thousand places available. The chances of us being selected were virtually non-existent. Well... Maybe if I had a fancy PhD, then our fate wouldn't be left in the hands of some toffee-nosed twats and their poxy lottery. It's not right, you know. They shouldn't decide who lives and who dies. Well, they can't save everyone. Well, then maybe they shouldn't save anyone. You're not serious. Why not? Extinction's a natural process. Clear out the old, make way for the new. If the dinosaurs hadn't gone extinct, then humans might not be here. And what the fuck have we done? Nout, but fight and fuck up the planet. Maybe the world would be better off without us. Start again. A clean slate. Well, personally, I'm glad that they're not letting 200,000 years of human knowledge, culture and civilization be lost forever without a fight. And they don't have to do the lottery, you know. They could have just selected the best people and said that's that. The best people... Some poncy upper-class twats who've never done a hard day's graft in their entire lives. What the fuck do they know about surviving? Well, probably more than we do. Those bunkers didn't build themselves, you know. As far as I'm concerned, they've earned their place. They deserve it. So their kids deserve to live, and ours deserve to fucking die, says Gary, angrily hitting the kitchen counter with his fist. Lisa jumps with fright. Her teacup slips from her hand and smashes on the floor. I'm sorry, Lise. I didn't mean to scare you. Here, I'll tidy this up. Gary steps towards Lisa. She steps back. Lise, you're not afraid of me, are you? I just lost it for a second. I'm fine now. I can control my temper these days. Just go, please, Gary. Lise. Gary, just go. Charlotte enters the kitchen. What's going on? She asks. Mom, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine, hun. I just dropped my mug. Say bye to your dad. He's leaving. Yeah, says Gary. There's nothing wrong, pet. Charlotte doesn't respond. She just stares at him. Well, Gary says after a moment, if you're sure I can't help tidy up, then I'll just head off. I'll pop back in the morning. Okay, Lise? Yeah, fine. We'll see you tomorrow. Okay. See you tomorrow, pet, Gary says to Charlotte. She still doesn't respond, so he leaves the kitchen. Did he threaten you? Charlotte asks Lisa. No, don't be daft. It was just a misunderstanding, and I dropped my cup like an idiot. Watch your feet. There's shards all over the floor. Can you get the dustpan and brush for me, please? Charlotte leaves the kitchen to fetch it. Lisa lets out a sigh. Gary stands on Lisa's front porch. Fuck, he says to himself as he lights a cigarette and takes a drag. He looks across to the house next door where there's a brand new top-of-the-range camper van parked on the driveway. He walks over to take a closer look and runs his finger down the side of the van. Hey, a voice shouts, get your filthy hands off that punk. Gary looks up and smiles when he sees Bill sitting on his porch, smoking a cigar. Gary walks up the porch steps to join him. Now then, Bill, says Gary as he shakes Bill's hand. Long time no see. 
Does Maureen know you're smoking that? You know those things'll kill you. Yeah, Bill laughs, but no quicker than that fucking volcano. Good to see you again, Gaz. Lisa said you were getting out. Bill takes a cigar out of his shirt pocket and offers it to Gary. Nah, says Gary, shaking his head. So, how was it? Bill asks, putting the cigar back into his pocket. Prison? Not too bad. Just kept my head down, stayed out of trouble, and counted down the days. Well, the timing couldn't be better. I mean, Lisa's as tough as they come. She's been managing well on her own, and you know she's not the type to ask for help, but she and the kids could certainly do with a fella around the place now. Don't worry about that, Bill. I'm not going anywhere. That boy of yours has been excited to see you again. Yeah, he's a good lad. Now, what do you call this? asks Gary, gesturing to the camper van. It must have set you back a bob or two. Well, you can't take it with you. Did you see David Milburn bought a Lamborghini the other week? Sounds like him, the flash git. So, where are you heading? Yellowstone. Yellowstone? What the fuck you going there for? We're in our seventies. Our best years are well and truly behind us. If we stay here, all we've got to look forward to is a slow and miserable death. Probably robbed and left to starve. That's if we're lucky. I tell you, when that thing blows, you're going to see what survival instinct does to people. They're talking on TV about community spirit and helping your neighbour like it's going to be an episode of the fucking Waltons. Yeah, when that thing blows, it's going to be every man for himself. Survival of the fittest. Oh, the meanest. You mark my words. So we figured the best thing to do would be to get on out there, pack up the van, crack open a bottle of cava, light up one of Cuba's finest, and wait for the greatest show on earth. Not a bad idea, says Gary. So how the hell are you going to get this thing over there? Boat. They're still shipping until the 17th. It takes a week, but it's not like we're in a hurry. Well, good luck to you. Thanks. Did you hear about the engineer over in Bellevue? Bill asks. No. What? He was on the news the other night. He designed the oxygenation system for the bunkers, so he and his family have a place. Just a young fella, like yourself. Has a few kids, too. It's not right, is it? says Gary. These fucking rich pricks. Had everything given to them on a silver platter their entire lives, and they're the ones that get a place. Not us, the grafters, the decent, hard-working fellas that shed blood, sweat and tears over the years to make this country what it is today. I risked life and limb in Iraq, and this is how they repay you. I tell you what, if I had my way, I'd go down there with a few hand grenades, find the central control room and pull the pin. Boom. Good night and good fucking luck. You might not have to, says Bill. What do you mean? I knew a bloke who worked for this engineer fella a few years back when they were machining parts for this thing. They didn't know it at the time, like. Just thought they were building something for the military. Anyway, he said deadlines were tight and things were rushed. Not every screw was tightened or bolt was checked, if you know what I mean. If they're not lucky, they might be no better off down there than we are up here. Well, that's some comfort, I suppose, says Gary. I tell you who leads the world in these things, says Bill. Who? The Japs, and the Dutch, to a lesser extent. Anywhere where you can't expand outwards, you have to go either up or down. They've been doing it for years. Underground shopping malls, hospitals, a lot. Great, says Gary. So, in the future, people might not be very tall, but they'll have a cracking pair of clogs. Bill laughs out loud. Anyway, Bill, I better be heading off. Up early in the morning. When do you leave? Two weeks on Thursday. Well, we'll pop round before then. Say goodbye and all that. Sure thing, Gaz. Take it easy, kid. Evie cuddles her teddy bear while Lisa tucks her into bed. Does this mean we're all going to heaven now with Grandma and Grandad? she asks. 
Not if I have anything to do with it, replies Lisa. Where'd you get that idea from? Ben said if we didn't get into the bunkers, we were all going to die like Grandma and Grandad. Don't listen to Ben. He's just been watching too much television. Nobody really knows what's going to happen, not even the brainiac scientists. And as long as I'm around to look after you all, then nobody's going to heaven for a very, very long time. Not until you're a little old lady like Nana Pat. Nana Pat had big glasses and false teeth, says Evie. I know she did. And you will too, one day. No, I won't. Yes, you will. You'll have to take your false teeth out every night and put them in a glass of water on your bedside cabinet. No, says Evie, giggling. Yeah. If you didn't have false teeth, you would just have to walk around like this, says Lisa, covering her teeth with her lips. Evie laughs out loud. And you wouldn't be able to bite anything. You'd just have to gum at things like this. Lisa playfully gums Evie on the neck. Stop it, Mum, stop it, Evie says, laughing and giggling. Lisa gives Evie a big kiss on the cheek. Right, night-night, honey bunch. Sleep tight, and I'll see you bright and early in the morning. Lisa turns off Evie's bedside light. Mum, leave the bedroom door open and the landing light on. I will, don't worry. See you in the morning, gorgeous. Evie waves her teddy's arm. Night, night, she says in a funny voice, trying not to move her lips. Lisa waves back. Night, night, Mr. Ted. Then she leaves the room, making sure that the bedroom door is left ajar so the landing light can shine through. In the basement, hundreds of cans of tinned food are neatly stacked in tall piles. Shelves on the walls contain survival equipment, including a gas stove, a paraffin heater, oil lamps and fuel. There's even a well in the far corner. Lisa's stacking more tinned food onto one of the piles. She stops to wipe the sweat from her brow. The basement door creaks open. Charlotte enters and walks down the wooden steps. I thought I'd find you down here, she says to Lisa. What'd you get this time? Well, there's grapefruit, prunes and some more spam. Mmm, tasty says Charlotte as she takes a seat on top of a wooden crate. How much did you pay for all that? Too much, Lisa replies. And I almost got into a fight with a very big scary looking bloke for the prunes. It was the last tray, and the cheeky git tried to pull it out of my hands. I stood my ground though, showed him who was boss. I'm not keen on prunes, says Charlotte. Me neither, I can't stand them. Both Lisa and Charlotte burst out laughing. Lisa sits down on a small stack of tins. She watches Charlotte pick at her fingernails. What are you thinking about? Nothing much. Does nothing much include your dad? Charlotte shrugs her shoulders. Do you think he's really changed? She asks. Not sure yet. I certainly think he's trying to. Do you think you two will ever get back together? No, not now. Too much water's passed under that particular bridge. I've been very clear about that. The only reason he's hanging around here is you three. So he can get his hands on our savings again. Don't say that. He made a stupid mistake once and he hates himself for it. I can tell. He's still your dad, remember. Not a very good one, says Charlotte, her voice breaking as tears begin to roll down her cheeks. She wipes them with her sleeve. Hey, come on, says Lisa as she moves to sit next to Charlotte. She gives her a cuddle. Look, I know he's been a bit crap in the past. No, let me rephrase that. I know he's been an absolute bloody idiot in the past. And I know you're angry about some of the things he's done. But you have to believe that he never intended to hurt any of you. It's just that your dad's got a bit of a warped sense of logic sometimes. He doesn't think things through. He goes on impulse and hopes for the best. When he took that money, he genuinely thought he could double or triple it with one of his hair-brained schemes. I'm not denying that he's done some bloody stupid things. I know that better than anyone. But I can tell that he regrets them, and he's trying to make amends. I've known your dad for a long time, and I know for a fact that he loves you all and would do anything to protect you. 
and you know me. I'm a gobby cow that shoots from the hip. I wouldn't say something if I didn't think it was true. Charlotte wipes her eyes and nods. You look exhausted, she says. I'm okay. You know, you don't have to worry so much about us. When it happens, we'll all stick together. You won't have to do everything on your own. I know, pet, but I'm an independent woman, you says Lisa, trying to act cool for comedic effect. Charlotte smiles and shakes her head. Hey, I'm serious, Lisa insists. Stop it, Mum, it's tragic. Oh, come on then, help your old mum back up the stairs, Lisa says as she gets to her feet. Charlotte stands up too, and Lisa puts her arm over her shoulders. Okay, says Charlotte, now just put one foot in front of the other. Hey, shut up, you. I'm not that old. Charlotte laughs, and the pair make their way up the wooden steps and out of the basement together. It's almost midnight. Gary is slouched on the sofa in his small, cramped flat. He has a bottle of beer in one hand and the television remote in the other. He flicks through the channels and stops on a news bulletin. The bunkers are designed to house the occupants for a minimum of five years, says the newsreader. Why five years? Well, scientists predict that it will take at least that long for the Earth's climate to recover enough to support a human population. The noxious gases must dissipate, the soil must recover, the ash in the sky must clear and allow the sunlight through. This will raise temperatures enough to allow crops to regrow. Gary turns off the television and tosses the remote to one side. He takes a swig of his beer and thinks to himself for a moment. He then picks up his phone and makes a call. After a few rings, someone answers. Now then, Dave, it's Gaz, says Gary into the phone. Gaz who? I served with you for two years and you've forgotten me already. Now how's that for friendship? Yeah, Gaz Graham. How you doing, kid? Yeah, I'm out and about. A free man these days. Just trying to stay out of trouble. You know how it is. How's the family? Gary listens for a moment and then laughs. Yeah, tell me about it. Listen, to be honest, I'm calling with a bit of an agenda. I just wondered if I could call in a favour. In the affluent, leafy neighbourhood, long driveways lead to grand houses with beautiful, well-kept gardens. Gary sits in his parked car at the side of the road, reading his newspaper. Across the street, the front door of one of the houses opens. Gary lowers his paper to observe a middle-aged man, Michael Robertson, with his wife, Julie, and young children, two girls and one boy, exit the house. They're smiling and joking as they board the people carrier that's parked on their driveway. Once everyone's aboard, they set off and drive away down the street. The spacious study is tastefully furnished with full wall bookshelves, filing cabinets, computer desk and drafting table. The door opens and Gary, wearing a baseball cap and gloves, enters. He looks around the room and then walks over to the bookshelves, he browses the books on display, which are all of a technical nature. Mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, construction, architecture. On one of the shelves, there's a framed photograph. Gary picks it up and examines it closely. It's a group shot of Michael and his family. They're all smiling and seeming very happy. Gary places the photo back down and then turns his attention to the filing cabinets. He opens each drawer and, one at a time, searches through the contents, but finds nothing of interest. He walks over to the computer desk and opens the desk drawer, which is full of paperwork. He sifts through the papers and stops when he finds a large brown envelope with a distinctive postmark. Gary takes the envelope out of the drawer and removes the enclosed documents, all of which bear the government letterhead. Suddenly, there's the faint sound of a door opening. Gary freezes. Leaving the front door wide open, Michael walks down the hallway and into the living room. He looks around the room, obviously searching for something, before entering the study. In the study, Michael walks over to his desk, where he picks up his glasses case and slips it into his jacket pocket. 
As he does so, he notices that the desk drawer is ever so slightly open. He looks at the drawer curiously for a moment, before closing it properly and then leaving the study. As the study door closes, Gary is revealed, standing up against the wall, holding a large glass paperweight in his hand. He doesn't move, he just waits and listens. On hearing the faint sound of the front door slamming shut, Gary walks back over to the desk and puts the paperweight down. He then opens the desk drawer and removes the brown envelope, this time making sure to close the drawer properly. Thirty days to go. The Prime Minister is working at his desk when there's a loud knock on his office door. What is it? he shouts, not taking his eyes off his computer screen. The Home Secretary enters in a hurry, closing the door behind her. I know you didn't want to be disturbed, but this can't wait, she says, handing the Prime Minister a document. What is it? Turn to page three. The Prime Minister does as instructed and studies the paragraph of text highlighted in yellow. Is this saying what I think it is? he asks, after a moment. Basically, the bunkers won't cope with the extra people selected by the lottery. There's not enough capacity. Capacity? There's not enough space. There's not enough food. There's not enough oxygen. I could go on. How can this be? Initial projections were off. Well, can't we do something about it? Bunk people together? Reduce rations? Get extra supplies from somewhere? Extra supplies? From where? From anywhere. You know we can't. And things are going to be far too close for comfort as it is with just those selected by merit. Fuck me, the Prime Minister says, sitting back in his chair. This can't be happening. We've already sent out the notifications. People will have received them already. I know. Well, what do we do? If we take them, says the Home Secretary, we jeopardise the survival of everyone, and they're the most expendable. Jesus. Well, we have to notify them. Immediately. I don't think that's a good idea. Why on earth not? You know how a lot of people feel about the bunkers. The military is struggling to keep control of the rioters as it is. If we cancel the lottery, there'll be absolute uproar. The bunkers will be breached. Well, what else can we do? If we can't take them, we have an obligation to let them know as soon as humanly possible. Do we? The Home Secretary asks. What are you suggesting? That we pick them up and then just drive them out into the middle of nowhere? Just leave them there to die? Or are you saying that we pull the trigger ourselves just to be on the safe side? I know this is a horrendous decision to make, but think about it. How else can we contain the situation? Consider the bigger picture here. You need to do what's best for the country. 20 days to go. Gary's waiting on Lisa's porch. Her car pulls into the driveway and she gets out along with Charlotte, Ben and Evie. What are you doing here? She asks as Gary walks down the steps to meet them. Well, that's a warm welcome, isn't it? He replies, jokingly. No, we just weren't expecting you until later. Ben rushes up to Gary. Guess what we are having for dinner tonight? He says excitedly. Well, let me think. Tonight, I reckon it'll be grilled spam served on a bed of boiled rice. And for dessert, a not-so-generous serving of tinned prunes. No, burgers. Burgers? Where'd you get those from? Mum bought them. Gary looks at Lisa. I bet they set you back a bit. Well, she replies, I thought we could all do with a treat. Well, that's very appropriate, actually, because I've got a bit of good news myself. What? asks Ben. I'll tell you when we get in sight, says Gary, as he walks over to Lisa, who's getting shopping out of the car. Do you want a hand, love? Yeah, thanks, she replies, handing Gary two full carrier bags. Gary and Lisa enter the kitchen, with Ben following close behind. Gary puts the shopping bags down onto the countertop. Well, what is it? asks Ben, impatiently. What's the good news? 
Go and get your sisters, instructs Gary. I want to tell you all together. Oh, this sounds interesting, says Lisa as Ben rushes out of the kitchen. Gary, Lisa, Charlotte, Ben and Evie all file into the living room together. Right, says Gary. Everyone take a seat. Lisa, Charlotte and Evie sit down on the sofa. Ben jumps into the armchair while Gary stands in front of the fireplace. He takes an opened envelope out of his jacket pocket and hands it to Charlotte. Here, pet, read this. Charlotte takes the letter out of the envelope. No, come up to the front, says Gary. Read it aloud. Charlotte reluctantly gets up and stands next to Gary. She unfolds the letter and begins to read. Dear Mr. Graham, you will have recently received a letter informing you that you and your family have not been selected for a place in the deep underground safety bunkers. I thought you said this was good news, says Lisa. Wait for it, love, Gary replies. Let her finish. He nudges Charlotte. Go on, pet. However, Charlotte continues, it has recently come to our attention that a clerical error means that you were incorrectly notified. We are very pleased to inform you that you do, in fact, have a place. Therefore, we would appreciate it if you could call us immediately on 020. What? says Lisa in astonishment. What? What does that mean? asks Ben. We have a place, asks Charlotte. We have a place in the bunkers, kid, Gary says with gusto. Oh my God, is this for real? Gary, this better not be a sick joke, Lisa threatens. Would I joke about something like this? Gary takes the letter out of Charlotte's hands and passes it to Lisa. Look at it. It's on the proper paper and everything. I could hardly believe it myself, but I've spent an hour on the phone with them this morning. We've made it. We've made it into the bloody bunkers. Excuse my language. The whole family starts celebrating excitedly. Gary puts his arm around Charlotte and hugs her tightly. Lisa cuddles Evie and kisses her on the cheek. Ben jumps up and down on the armchair, accidentally knocking over the porcelain lamp that's on the side table next to him. It topples over and smashes on the floor. Sorry, he says in a panic. Don't worry, pet, says Lisa. I always hated that lamp. Hang on, I bought that for you, says Gary, somewhat offended. I know, Lisa replies in an outburst of laughter. Everyone else sees the funny sight and starts laughing too. Ben picks up the vase from the side table. What about this? he asks. All right, kid, Gary says, quickly taking the vase out of his hands. You can leave some things intact. Everyone laughs again and jumps around excitedly. It's evening and the family are gathered around the dining table, merrily feasting on their burgers. They can hardly contain their smiles. Can I open another carton of juice? asks Ben. What do you think, Lise? It's a celebration, after all, says Gary. Go on, then, Lisa replies. Ben gets up from the table. Bring another bottle of wine while you're at it, she adds. Oh, check out your mother, Gary says to the kids. She's going all out tonight. We'll have to carry her upstairs at bedtime. Hey, I can handle my booze, thank you very much, Lisa protests. Ben comes back to the table with a bottle of wine and a carton of juice. Gary opens the wine. Can I have a glass, Mum? asks Charlotte. Gary looks at Lisa, waiting for her response. Go on then, just the one, mind. Gary pours some wine into Charlotte's glass. There you go, pet. Oh, can I have some, Mum? asks Ben. You don't want any of this, kid, says Gary. Have some of my beer, a real man's drink. That's as long as it's okay with your mother, like, he adds, looking at Lisa for her approval. Please, Mum, begs Ben. Go on, then, says Lisa. Top it up with lemonade, though. I don't want you all nursing hangovers in the morning. We've got a busy day ahead of us. Ben pours some of Gary's beer into his cup while Gary tops up Lisa's glass with wine. And what can we get Madame Evie this evening? Gary asks, pretending to be a butler. Juice, she replies. Some sparkling orange juice for the lady. Hey, we're living it up tonight, aren't we? Says Gary as he opens the juice and pours some into Evie's beaker. 
Yeah, agrees Ben. I can't wait until I tell Martin about this tomorrow. Hang on there, kid. I'm not sure it's a good idea to be spreading it about just yet. Why not? Because I know how people around here think. Jealous people can do silly things. Martin won't do anything. Maybe not, but other people might. I just think it's safer if we keep it between the five of us. Just for now, like. We can tell other people a bit closer to the time. What do you say, Elise? Yeah, Lisa agrees. Your dad's probably right. Let's keep it our little secret for the time being. Our little secret, repeats Evie. That's right, pet. Our little secret. Now, let's have a toast, Gary says, picking up his bottle of beer. Come on, raise your glasses. Everyone raises their glasses. I just wanted to say that I know I haven't been around much over the past, well, ever, really. I've missed a lot of your growing up and haven't been around to take care of you all like I should have been. But from now on, that's all gonna change. I consider myself to be the luckiest man in the world to have such a wonderful family like you lot, who've been kind and generous enough to give me a second chance, even though I probably don't deserve it. And I'm really looking forward to getting to know you all again. That's it, really. That's all I wanted to say. To family. To family, says Lisa. Right, now stop being a soppy git and finish your burger before it goes cold. Everyone laughs. Twelve days to go. Charlotte and Ben are strolling along the quiet residential street, heading towards home. Ben's kicking a small stone in front of him, like he's dribbling a football. Do you think there'll be a cinema? he asks. Maybe, Charlotte replies, but we'll have to watch old films. Why? Think about it. Who's going to make new ones? Oh, yeah. Well, I hope they have the Goonies. Just ahead of them, Kimberly Wells is leaving her house. Hi, Kim, says Charlotte. Oh, hi, Charlotte. Hi, Ben, says Kimberly, as she stops to make conversation. It's been a while since we've seen each other, says Charlotte. I know, I can't remember the last time. There's a moment of silence as neither side can think of a way to progress the conversation. So, how are things? Charlotte eventually asks. How's your mum? She's okay, you know, considering. We're all getting sick of eating beans and rice, but apart from that, we're fine. Yeah, I know what you mean. For us, it's spam. Every day. We don't even cook it anymore, just straight out of the can. Well, it's quick and easy, I suppose. Yeah, agrees Charlotte. There's another awkward moment. Well, Charlotte continues, we'll have to get together sometime, have a bit of a catch-up. Yeah, that would be nice. You're free to pop round any time. You know where we are. Cool. Well, I'd better get going, says Kimberly. Told Mum I wouldn't be long. I don't want her to send out a search party again. Okay, see ya. See ya. Bye, Ben. Ben waves. Kimberly smiles again and walks off down the street in the opposite direction. Oh, that felt terrible, says Charlotte. Why? Ben asks, but Charlotte doesn't answer him. Come on, she says. Mum will be expecting us back too. Outside Lisa's house, Lynn is waiting next to her car. Lisa approaches, carrying two trays of canned food. Open the car door, she shouts. Lynn does as instructed, and Lisa loads the trays into the back seat of Lynn's car, and then slams the door shut. Lisa, are you sure I can't do anything in return? Lynn asks. I haven't got much money left, but I must be able to do something. Yeah, says Lisa. You can stop feeling like you owe me. You've looked out for me enough over the years. As far as I'm concerned, it's the least I can do. Oh, thank you, Lisa. Come here, says Lisa. Give me a hug. The women embrace, just as Charlotte and Ben return home. Lisa notices them. Oh, here's trouble, she says. Lynn wipes a tear from her eye and then turns to face the kids with a smile. 
God, look how much you two have grown. I bet you don't even remember me, do you? I used to have tea parties on the lawn with you and your dolls, Lynn says to Charlotte. And the last time I saw you, young man, she says to Ben, you were running around here in nothing but your birthday suit. Yeah, says Lisa, he's always been a bit of an exhibitionist. Ben looks coy. On noticing her brother's embarrassment, Charlotte smiles. Oh, I'm embarrassing him now, says Lynn. Well, I'll get away before I embarrass them even further. Thanks again, Lisa. You don't know how much I appreciate this. Yes, I do, so don't say another word. Bye, kids, says Lynn, giving them a wave. Bye, says Charlotte. Bye, says Ben. Lynn gets into her car and drives away. People will get suspicious, Charlotte says to Lisa. Just don't tell your dad and it'll be fine. Now, come on, you two. You can help me pack. In Lisa's bedroom, the wardrobe doors and cabinet drawers are wide open. There are piles of clothes all over the floor surrounding an empty suitcase. Lisa enters the room. Charlotte follows close behind and sits down on the bed. I've been trying to ration my wardrobe, says Lisa, but it's hard to know what you'll need in an underground bunker. Well, you probably won't need this, says Charlotte, holding up a bikini. I don't think there'll be many opportunities for sunbathing. They might have spas and tanning salons for all you know, smarty pants. Charlotte smiles. She puts the bikini back down, slumps against the wall, and lets out a sigh. What's wrong, gloomy guts? asks Lisa. We just bumped into Kimberly Wells. I know we're not that close anymore, but it's a horrible feeling knowing that somebody you've grown up with will be left out here, basically to die. And you won't. I said I'd go over to hers and catch up, but I don't know if I can do it. Tell me about it. I bumped into her mother the other day. I remember going to antenatal classes with her just before you two were born. It's heartbreaking. I'll come with you if you want. I can chat to her mum. Yeah, that would be good. That's why I gave the food to that lady. I've worked with her almost every day since I was 21. We've always looked out for each other. She's got two kids, and her husband walked out on her last year, left a note saying he was shacked up with some little slapper from his office. After 20 years of marriage... Lisa picks up a cardigan, folds it loosely, and puts it into the suitcase. I can still see the cogs turning, she says, looking at Charlotte. What's on your mind? Don't you think it's a little bit strange? Charlotte asks. Probably, but you'll have to be more specific. The mix-up with the lottery. People make mistakes all the time where I work. This kind of thing happens, and you saw the letter yourself. It looked genuine enough to me. Charlotte doesn't respond. You don't think so? asks Lisa. The letter looked genuine, but there was a spelling mistake. Well, anybody can make a typo. Imagine how stretched the government must be right now. People are frantic. Letters aren't getting proofread. That's probably how the mix-up happened in the first place. I suppose so, Charlotte concedes. I once wrote a letter to your dad when he was inside and sent it to my mother by mistake, says Lisa. It's a good job I didn't put anything racy in it. You don't think he's making the whole thing up, do you? I mean, Gary couldn't fake the letter. He can't even turn on a computer. And what happens when the time comes and nobody comes to collect us? What would he do then? Listen, he's stupid, but he's not that stupid. If this turns out to be just his attempt to raise our spirits, he won't have to worry about being killed by a volcano. I can promise you that. Charlotte smiles. I'm serious. Check out the guns, says Lisa, tensing her biceps. That's what you get from hauling around crates of tinned meat. I'd hammer him into the ground like a goddamn tent peg. Charlotte shakes her head and laughs. Oh, you find that funny, do you? asks Lisa as she jumps onto the bed and begins to play fight with Charlotte. She pulls up Charlotte's t-shirt and blows raspberries on her stomach. Charlotte screams and giggles. It's evening and the whole family is quietly watching television together. 
Lisa, Charlotte, and Evie are cuddled together on the sofa. Evie's fast asleep. Ben's sitting on the floor with his headphones on, engrossed by the video game on his handheld games console. Gary's relaxing in the armchair. He looks at his watch. Well, I better be heading off, he says. Did you get those photos for the IDs, Lise? Yeah, they're in the top drawer of the sideboard with the passports, as promised. Good stuff, says Gary, as he gets up out of the chair and walks over to the sideboard. He opens the top drawer and takes out the photographs and passports. Why do we need our passports? asks Charlotte. We're not leaving the country, are we? We just need them for identification, pet. I have to include the numbers on our forms. Just give us the forms if you want, says Lisa. We'll fill them in. Oh, so you don't trust me to do it properly. I can read and write, you know, says Gary, jokingly. No, I didn't mean that. It's just you seem to be doing everything, and we want to help. I know, love. I'm only messing. The forms are almost done. There's just a couple of things I need to fill in now. Okay. Well, if you want us to do anything, just say. I will, love. Right. Don't disturb Evie. I'll let myself out. See you all tomorrow. See ya, says Lisa. Night, says Charlotte as Gary leaves. Lisa and Charlotte look at each other. Charlotte raises her eyebrows and then smiles. Lisa kisses her on the forehead. And then they both turn their attention back to the television. Two days to go. Gary enters his flat, somewhat out of breath, and slams the door shut behind him. He has a deep scratch below his left eye, and the blood from it trickles down his cheek. He takes off his jacket, throws it onto the armchair, and hurries into the bathroom. He briefly inspects the wound in the mirror, rinses his face in the sink, and then pats himself dry with a towel. Gary enters the living room and sits down on the sofa, letting out a huge sigh of relief. Fucking hell. Right, come on, you're not done yet, he says to himself as he leans forward and reaches for the brown envelope on the coffee table. He removes one of the documents and then takes out his phone and dials a number. The phone rings a few times before somebody answers. Michael Robertson, Gary says. He then looks at the document. Alpha Charlie 9183, he reads, and then waits for a moment. Yes, hello. I'm not sure who I need to speak to about this, but I need to change my pickup location for tomorrow. No, no, there's no problem. It's just that my wife wants to spend our last night at her sister's place. So if we could get picked up from there instead, it would be a big help. Yeah, yeah. No problem. I'll hold. One day to go. There are six large suitcases and several smaller bags in the middle of Lisa's living room. Evie's watching cartoons on the television. Ben's sitting on the sofa playing his video game. The doorbell rings, but neither Ben nor Evie respond. In the hallway, Charlotte opens the front door to reveal Gary standing on the porch with his suitcase in hand. He's dressed very smartly, clean-shaven, with his hair neatly combed. Wow, says Charlotte clearly surprised by Gary's new look. What do you think, he asks. Your old man scrubs up pretty well, eh? You look... Charlotte pauses to think. Different? Oh, well, thanks for the ego boost, pet. Gary enters the house and Charlotte closes the door behind him. No, I mean good different. I've just never seen you like this before. It's a bit of a shock. Lisa walks down the stairs into the hallway... Okay, she says to Gary, who the heck are you and what have you done with my husband? You cheeky gits. I just thought I'd make a good impression. First impressions last and all that. Oh, so it's not permanent then, Lisa asks. You never know. This could be the new me. Charlotte looks at the scratch below Gary's eye. What happened to your face? Oh, you'll never believe this. Yesterday, I was helping the bloke from the flat below mine shift some stuff out of the garden. I was carrying this big old box, looking down where I was stepping like, and whack, walked right into this overhanging tree branch. It's my own fault. I knew it was there. 
I must have walked past it a hundred times. I almost took my bloody eye out. I tell you, that's what you get for being a good Samaritan. Oh, poor you, says Lisa. Evie will kiss it better for you. I was kind of hoping you would, to be honest. Well, you can always live in hope, says Lisa, as she walks into the living room. Gary looks at Charlotte. When did she get so mean, he asks. Charlotte just smiles, and then she and Gary follow Lisa into the living room. All right there, chief. Ready for the big day? Gary asks Ben. Ben nods his head without taking his eyes away from his game console. Well, I see that you can hardly contain your excitement. So, do you have everything sorted, Gary? Lisa asks. All the IDs and paperwork. Yeah, don't worry. I've crossed all the I's and dotted all the T's. Something like that, anyway. It's all safe and sound right here, Gary says, patting his jacket pocket. Since when did you get so organised? Charlotte asks. It's never too late to change, pet. I learnt that inside. Charlotte and Lisa look at each other, both surprised and impressed. A black minivan with tinted windows, escorted by two armoured military jeeps, drives along the residential street. The procession of vehicles pulls to a stop directly outside Lisa's house. An armed soldier gets out of each escort vehicle. They stand guard. In the living room, Evie and Charlotte are watching the television while Ben's playing his video game. Gary's peering out the front window, nervously playing with the contents of his pockets. Okay, he says, it looks like our carriage has arrived. Ben drops his game console and rushes across to the window to take a look. All right, kid, go and get your mum, Gary says, but Ben can't draw himself away from the window. Gary turns to Charlotte. Can you take care of your sister, pet? Yeah, Charlotte replies, as Gary rushes out of the living room. Charlotte gets up off the sofa and walks across to Evie. Come on, Eves, it's time to go on holiday, she says, taking Evie by the hand. Ben still hasn't budged from the window. He watches as a suited man gets out of the lead jeep and makes his way towards the house. He then sees Gary exit the house, jog down the porch steps and meet the man halfway up the driveway. They shake hands. Gary and Ben are loading the last suitcase into the minivan. A crowd of onlookers have gathered across the street. They keep their distance, but watch curiously and chat among themselves. Charlotte leaves the house with Evie holding onto her hand. Lisa follows them out and pulls the door shut behind her. They approach the minivan together. Right, are we all set? Gary asks. I think so, Charlotte replies. I'm all set, says Evie, proudly. Gary smiles at her. That's a good girl, he says. I can't help feeling that we've forgotten something, says Lisa. Gary rolls his eyes. You always say that. Remember when we used to go to Scarborough? We always had to turn round when we got to the end of the street so you could have one last check. We never forgot anything, though. Yeah, I know. Anyway... At the end of the day, as long as we've got the five of us, then we've got everything we need. Yeah, you're right, says Lisa, as she looks at the spectators who have amassed across the street. Kimberly Wells and her mother are among them. I feel so guilty. I know, says Charlotte. Me too. You've got nought to feel guilty about, says Gary. Do you think any of these lot would turn down a place in the bunkers because we didn't have one? I know, Lisa replies, but I've known a lot of these people ever since we moved here. That's over 16 years. It's just hard, that's all. Yeah, I know it is, love. The suited man approaches. Excuse me, Mr. Robertson, he says to Gary. Are you ready to depart? We really need to be making tracks. Yeah, as ready as we'll ever be. Okay, then please board the van. I'll ride ahead in the lead escort vehicle, but your driver will be able to contact me if necessary. Spot on, pal, says Gary, and the suited man walks away. Did he just call you Mr. Robertson? asks Lisa. Yeah, must have just got his names mixed up. 
Right, get on board, you lot, or they'll be leaving us behind. The family board the minivan. Gary gets in last and slides the door closed behind him. The suited man and the armed guards get back into the armoured jeeps and the procession of vehicles sets off and drives away down the street into the distance. In the minivan, everyone just sits quietly. They look out of the windows as they leave their old neighbourhood behind. Gary puts his hand on Charlotte's knee. You okay, pet? he asks. Charlotte smiles and nods. Excuse me, Lisa says loudly to get the attention of the driver who glances at her in the rear view mirror. Yes, he says. How far is it? Just under 300 miles. It'll be dark by the time we get there. Do you have to pick up many more people? Nope, we've been doing this for the past few weeks. You're the last ones. Oh, wow. Actually, the driver says, I should probably give you a bit of a heads up. What about? asks Gary. When we get closer to the bunkers, it's going to get a little bit hairy. In what way? Well, there's going to be large groups of protesters. Now, the immediate perimeter is heavily fortified, but on the lead up there, there could be quite a bit of a disturbance. There's no need to be concerned. They don't have the ability to stop the vehicles, but there could be a lot of loud noises and things hitting the sides of the van as we drive past. Are the windows toughened glass? Bulletproof. Don't worry about that. I just wanted to make you aware so that it's not a big surprise. Okay, cheers, pal. In the darkness, all that can be seen through the windows of the minivan are a few lights from a small settlement way off in the distance. Lisa cuddles Evie, who's fast asleep. So too are Ben and Charlotte, curled up in their seats. Lisa and Gary are awake, but they just sit quietly. The minivan suddenly begins to accelerate. Hold on to your seats, the driver says. Lisa looks at Gary, clearly concerned. Suddenly, there's a loud bang that sends vibrations through the van. The kids wake up, startled. Evie begins to cry. It's okay, babe. Don't be scared, Lisa says, doing her best to comfort her. It'll be over in a minute. What was that? asks Charlotte. Don't worry, pet, Gary replies. Something just hit the side of the van. It's okay, though. Remember, this thing's bulletproof. Loud and rapid gunfire followed by screams can be heard from outside. Then everything goes quiet. Nothing else hits the van. Armed soldiers patrol the brightly floodlit military base. One of them waves the minivan and armoured jeeps onward through the gates. The convoy of vehicles comes to a stop in front of a huge doorway seemingly built into the side of a mountain. Two enormous steel doors slowly open and the minivan drives in. Once inside, the minivan comes to a stop. The driver gets out and slides the side door open. Here we are, folks, he says. You need your IDs and documentation ready for checking. Gary climbs out of the van and looks around. No problem, I'll take care of that. A porter drives over on a motorised luggage cart. The minivan driver holds out his hand to Gary. Well, good luck to you. Yeah, you too, Gary replies, shaking the man's hand. Take care. The driver then gestures to a check-in desk attended by a female soldier. Check-in's just over there. Okay, cheers, pal. Gary turns to Lisa, who's climbing out of the van holding Evie. Hey, Lise, you and the kids take care of the luggage. I'll go and get us checked in. Yeah, don't worry about us, Lisa replies. We've got a big strong man here to help. Ben and Charlotte climb out of the van too. They look around in awe. Wow, this place is huge, says Ben. You ain't seen nothing yet, kid, says the driver, giving Ben a wink. At the check-in desk, Stuart Martin, with his wife, Sarah, and five-year-old son, Oliver, are waiting while the soldier examines their documentation. Gary approaches and waits his turn in line. You must be the last ones, says Stuart. So they tell us, Gary replies. I'm Stuart. This is my wife, Sarah, and my son, Oliver. 
Both Sarah and Oliver smile politely. How you all doing? Gary asks. And you are? asks Stuart. Michael, Gary replies. And what do you do, Michael? I'm a physicist myself. I help to develop the DSL. DSL? Yes, the daylight simulation lighting. Oh, yeah, of course. I'm an engineer. I designed the oxygenation system. Really? says Stuart, somewhat surprised. Yeah? That's strange. What is? Well, at one of the last progress review meetings, the one in Glasgow, I think, I sat on a table for lunch with a chap who claimed to have designed the oxygenation system. I'm sure he said his name was Michael too. Weird, says Gary. Maybe he was telling porkies. Perhaps, but he seemed extremely knowledgeable about the whole thing. That is strange. The soldier finishes checking Stuart's documentation. Okay, that's fine, sir. Here's your paperwork, she says, handing the documents back to Stuart. She presses a button on the desk. There's a loud buzzing noise and a green light flashes above the turnstiles. Please proceed through the turnstiles, sir. You and your family will be escorted to the biometric facilities. Stuart smiles and nods. He then turns to Gary. Well, nice to meet you. Perhaps we can get together sometime when we've both had a chance to settle in. I'll look forward to it, says Gary. Stuart, Sarah and Oliver proceed through the turnstiles. Gary watches them as they walk away. Your documentation, please, sir, the soldier says to Gary. Excuse me? I need to check your documents, please, sir. Oh, yeah, sorry. Gary hands over the necessary IDs and documentation. The soldier begins to make her checks, just as Lisa, Charlotte, Ben and Evie join Gary at the check-in desk. Everything okay? Lisa asks. Yeah, they're just making sure we are who we say we are, Gary replies. The soldier opens up the first passport. There's a photo of Lisa, but the name reads Julie Robertson. I can't believe we're actually here, says Charlotte. I know, says Lisa. It's surreal, isn't it? Well, kids, this is home for the next five years. There's no escaping us in here. Careful, love, warns Gary. They might decide to take their chances on the surface. The telephone at the check-in desk begins to ring. The soldier answers it quickly. Hello, she says. There's a pause as the soldier listens intently. She looks up at Gary. No, sir, I'm just checking the documentation now. Gary, Lisa and Charlotte look at each other with bemused expressions. Yes, sir, I understand, the soldier says before ending the call. Is there a problem? Gary asks. No, sir, we're just running slightly behind schedule. We need to get you processed so that we can close the blast doors. She flicks through the other passports quickly and then hands all of the documentation back to Gary. She then presses the button. Again, there's a buzz, followed by a green flashing light above the turnstiles. Please go through the turnstiles and you'll be escorted to the biometric facilities. Biometric? What's that? asks Lisa. Identifying people by their physical characteristics, replies Charlotte. Fingerprints and retina scans, stuff like that. Is that really necessary? Gary asks. I mean, you've just checked our documentation. It's how everything works in the bunkers, sir, the soldier replies. Access to your living quarters, access to services, provisioning of rations. No need for swipe cards. Very high tech, says Lisa, clearly impressed. The minivan drives out of the military base. One of the soldiers speaks into his radio, and the huge steel doors in the rock face begin to close. Another soldier turns to his comrade. Well, looks like this is it, he says. Yeah, take care, buddy, his comrade replies as the men shake hands. All around the base there are similar scenes, comrades saying their farewells before slowly dispersing. The biometric lab is small, but full of sophisticated-looking equipment. Gary, Lisa, Charlotte, Ben and Evie cautiously enter. The lab technician looks up from his computer. 
Do you have your identification, sir? He asks. Yes, right here, Gary replies, handing over all five passports. Thank you. OK, shall we start with you, sir? Please step up to the machine. Place your chin on the rest and your hands on the scanners. Gary tentatively walks up to the scanning machine and does as he's told. The technician looks at the computer monitor. Stay as still as you can, sir. Keep your eyes open and look directly ahead, he says, and he begins the scan. Gary is slightly startled as the machine makes a loud humming noise. The technician closely watches the monitor as scans of Gary's face and fingerprints appear on the screen. Gary, Lisa, Charlotte, Ben and Evie are accompanied in the lift by the luggage porter on his motorised cart. The porter presses the button for floor 12 and the doors slide shut. You might want to hold on to something, he says. There's a bit of a jolt when we begin to move. The lift jolts and everyone holds on to the sides to steady themselves. Bloody hell, says Gary. You weren't joking, were you? Mum, I don't like it, says Evie, beginning to cry. Lisa picks her up. It's okay, babe. It's meant to happen. Yeah, don't worry, love, says Gary. We'll be at the bottom soon. How far down is it? He asks the porter. About 500 feet at the lowest point. Think of a 40-storey building, only going downwards. Can you believe that, kids? Wow, says Ben. That's a long way down. You're not wrong there, kid. The lift comes to a stop. This is your floor, says the porter as the doors slide open. Gary, Lisa, Charlotte, Ben and Evie tentatively step out into a long corridor. There are doors along one side and a railing along the other. Charlotte and Ben look over the railing to see eleven similar floors down below, and at the very bottom, lots of people are busily walking about like ants. Oh my God, says Charlotte. Look at all the people way down there. Gary looks over the railing too. Jesus, this is incredible. Take a look at this, love, he says to Lisa. No thanks, she replies, keeping her distance. I'm not the biggest fan of heights. I'm fine where I am. The porter drives the luggage cart out of the lift. Follow me, he says, as he continues onward along the corridor. Gary, Lisa, Charlotte, Ben and Evie follow close behind while looking around in awe. The porter slows to a stop outside one of the doors. Here we are, he says. 12.59. This will be your home for the next five years or so. Great, says Gary. Remember that number, kids. There'll be a welcome pack inside, which includes some information cards with your apartment number on and various other things, says the porter. You can carry them around with you until you get settled in. Oh, that's helpful, says Lisa. You can unlock the door with your thumb, the porter continues. Just press it up against the sensor. Can I do it, Dad? Ben asks excitedly. Go for it, kid. Ben presses his thumb against the sensor. A light turns from red to green, and there's a faint thudding noise as the door's magnetic lock releases. Now, just push, the porter instructs. Ben pushes the door open and enters the apartment. As he does, the lights flicker on automatically. The modern but compact apartment has an open-plan living area with a small kitchen in the far corner. Two doorways lead to other rooms. As Ben looks around, the rest of the family follow him in and do the same. What's in there? Ben asks as he walks over to one of the doorways and looks through. It's the bathroom, he shouts. Charlotte looks through the other doorway. This is the bedroom. There's only one, asks Ben, barging past Charlotte to take a look. There are only three beds. The porter enters the apartment carrying two suitcases. The sofa pulls out into a double bed, he says, as he puts the cases down. There you go, says Gary. You lot can sleep in there, and me and your mum can sleep out here on the sofa. Or me and mum can sleep on the sofa, says Charlotte. I want to sleep on the sofa, shouts Evie. All right, all right, says Gary. We'll sort something out. So, what do you think, kids? It's not too shabby. I thought it would be bigger, says Ben, clearly disappointed. Yeah, but just think how many people they have to fit down here, kid. There must be thousands of apartments, just like this one. 
It'll be a lot more homely when we've unpacked our stuff and got settled in, says Lisa. Yeah, Gary agrees. And I bet there's loads of things to do down here anyway. We probably won't be in here very much, just to lay our heads at night. And maybe if we want a bit of peace and quiet every now and again. Lisa sits down on the small sofa and lets out an exhausted sigh. Well, I don't know about anybody else, she says, but I'm absolutely shattered. Yeah, me too, love. It's been a long day. Let's get some sleep. I'm sure we'll all feel a lot better in the morning. In the bedroom, Charlotte's lying in the single bed. Ben's sitting on the top bunk of the bunk beds, reading the welcome pack. Evie's in the bottom bunk, and Lisa's tucking her in. There you go, babe. All tucked in, safe and sound, Lisa says. She kisses Evie on the cheek. Evie holds up her teddy bear. Kiss Mr. Ted, too. Lisa kisses Mr. Ted on the nose. Night-night, Mr. Ted, she says. Take care of my daughter. Mum, it says there's a tour of the bunkers tomorrow at 10 a.m. Can we go? asks Ben. I don't see why not. We need to get our bearings somehow, Lisa replies as she gets up to her feet. Mum, will you leave the door open? asks Evie. I'll leave it open a little bit. But you don't have to be scared in here. You've got your big brother and sister to look after you now. Are you sure you're okay sleeping through there? asks Charlotte. You can fit in here with me. I slept in the same bed as your dad for years before we split up. I'm sure I can put up with him for a few more. It's his snoring that I'm worried about the most. I forgot to bring my earplugs. Lisa turns her attention to Ben. Right, get to sleep, mister. You've got plenty of time to read this in the morning, she says, taking the welcome pack out of his hands. Night-night, you lot. See you all in the morning. Night-night, Evie replies. Night, says Charlotte. Night, says Ben, as he gets underneath his bed covers. Lisa leaves and gently pulls the door to, leaving it slightly ajar. Day of the Eruption The ground floor walkways seemed to stretch on endlessly like a huge underground shopping centre. There's a group of people boarding a shuttle bus. The doors of a lift slide open and Lisa steps out, holding a map. She's closely followed by Ben, Charlotte, Gary and Evie. Look, that's it, Mum, says Ben, pointing towards the bus. See, says Lisa, I said we were going in the right direction. Come on then, Captain Cook. We don't want to miss it, says Gary, as he picks up Evie and jogs towards the bus, with the others following close behind. The shuttle bus is packed full of people. There's not a single seat to spare. The passengers gaze out of the windows, excitedly pointing things out to one another. The tour guide stands at the front with a microphone in hand. Coming up on your left-hand side is the main medical facility for the bunker, he says. It's just like a normal hospital, so if ever you require any kind of medical treatment, then this is the place to come. This is also where you'll come for your regular health checks. In the case of an emergency, there's an ambulance service which is contactable from any phone within the bunker. Just dial zero and speak to the operator. Like those of an enormous boiler room, a complicated network of pipes protrude from the rock walls and funnel into massive metal tanks. Pumps make a continual drone. The tour guide leads people through. So this is where the water is extracted from the bedrock and pumped into these huge containers. The natural debris from the earth is filtered out and things such as fluoride, phosphorus and calcium are added to help prevent bone weakening and conditions such as rickets in the young and the elderly. Gary, Lisa, Charlotte, Ben and Evie are at the back of the group. What's rickets? asks Evie. We did it at school, says Ben. It's when your legs go all bendy and you can't walk properly, like this. Ben starts walking with bowed legs. Will we get rickets? Evie asks, clearly alarmed. No, says Lisa. The man just said they put things into the water to prevent it. So, do you know what you have to do? What? Evie asks. Drink lots and lots of water. This is absolutely amazing, says Gary, looking around in awe. 
You don't think about all this, do you? I mean, you go to the tap and water comes out. You take it for granted. But we wouldn't last long without it, that's for sure. The fella that came up with this deserves a medal. How do you know it was a man? asks Charlotte. You're right, pet, I don't. Man or woman, I'd buy them a drink any day. Who? Oh, you'd splash out on a drink, says Lisa. Lucky them. Oh, do you get it? Splash. Lisa and Charlotte laugh. Gary looks at Ben and shakes his head. Women. The oxygenation chamber is filled with thousands of lush green plants. Bright lights hang just a few feet above them, and fans in the walls whir around slowly. The tour guide leads people through. This is just one of several oxygenation chambers, he explains. Every breath that each one of us takes removes a small amount of oxygen from the air and expels a small amount of carbon dioxide, or CO2, which is a waste product of respiration. However, plants work in reverse. Through a process called photosynthesis, they extract carbon dioxide from the air and expel oxygen. A sophisticated ventilation system pumps the CO2 into these chambers. It also extracts the oxygen from the chambers and distributes it around the bunkers. Without this system, the air would become unbreathable in just over a day. That's amazing, isn't it? says Lisa. Yeah, yeah, it is, pet, says Gary, seemingly unenthused. You okay? Yeah, I'm fine, love. It's all just a bit much to take in, isn't it? I mean, a bunch of plants are keeping us alive. Plants were always keeping us alive, says Charlotte. Yeah, but this really hits at home. It's incredible. Back on the shuttle bus, Gary, Lisa, Charlotte, Ben and Evie are sitting together, listening to the guide. So, we're going to stop shortly for a break, but this afternoon we'll be visiting a supply store where you can get luxury food items in exchange for credits. We'll also visit the school where some of the younger people among us will be going in a couple of weeks' time. School, says Ben, clearly surprised. Do we have to go to school? Yeah, of course you do, kid, says Gary. You and your sisters are the future of human civilization. We're relying on you lot to save humanity. No pressure, like. You have to go to school so you can come up with the next lot of ingenious inventions, like the fellas who made this place. Gary looks at Charlotte. And ladies, he adds. Mom, do we have to? asks Ben. Yeah. What else are you going to do all day? Lisa asks. Sit in your backside and play computer games. Me and your dad have to work. You should go to school. What are you and dad going to do? Don't know yet. We haven't had our roles assigned. But everybody's got to do something. It's not a holiday camp, you know. Everyone's got to earn their place. Do you reckon your mum missed her calling in life? Gary asks. I'm thinking either prison warden or drill sergeant. Ben and Charlotte laugh. In the ground floor walkways, groups of people are standing almost still, not speaking to one another. They're looking up at large television screens. The shuttle bus slows to a stop, and the passengers begin to unload. Gary, Lisa, Charlotte, Ben, and Evie are among them. I don't know about anyone else, says Lisa, but I could murder a cup of tea. Yeah, me too, love, says Gary. I'm parched. Right then, we've only got an hour, so let's find some toilets and then get something to eat. Sounds like a plan. Mum, says Charlotte. Yeah, Lisa replies. Charlotte points up to one of the television screens. It's showing a massive volcanic eruption. Huge mushroom-shaped ash clouds explode into the atmosphere. Bolts of lightning illuminate the blackened sky. Another screen shows a town in mayhem. The daytime skies are black. The roads are gridlocked. People frantically scream and run for cover as volcanic bombs descend from the sky. It started, says Gary, right on time. All around, people are sobbing and comforting each other. Is this a film, Mummy? Evie asks Lisa. No, pet. No, it's not. But we are safe. Nothing can happen to us way down here. 
Gary puts his hands on Ben and Charlotte's shoulders. You all right, kids? he asks. Ben nods his head, his gaze fixed on the screen. Yeah, Charlotte replies. I just can't believe this is happening. People must be absolutely terrified, she says, wiping tears from her eyes. I know, Ped. I know. The canteen is full of people, but the atmosphere is sombre. Gary, Lisa, Charlotte, Ben and Evie are sitting at a table with trays of processed food in front of them, but they're not eating much. Ben pushes some of his food around with his fork. Gary takes another mouthful of his meal. It's actually not that bad. I was expecting it to be a lot worse, to be honest, he says. Why can't we have pizza or something like that? asks Ben. Dunno, kid, but this is better than pizza. This is what the astronauts used to eat on the space station. Doesn't taste like much, but it's got all your vitamins and minerals in it to keep you healthy. Lisa puts down her cutlery. I just don't have an appetite, she says. Me neither, says Charlotte. Yeah, says Gary. It's been a bit of a weird day, hasn't it? Maybe you'll feel like eating something later on. There's a fella over there that keeps looking at you, Lisa says to Gary. Is that the bloke you were talking to at the check-in desk yesterday? Gary turns around to see Stuart sitting at another table with his wife and son. Stuart looks away quickly. Yeah, I think it is, Gary replies. Do you want to go over and say hello? Nah, we only said a few words to each other. I know, but I think we should make an effort to be friendly with people. We'll all feel a lot better down here when we have some other folk to talk to and to do things with. I know, Ped, but they're probably not in the best of moods either. Anyway, it's only our first proper day down here. I tell you, when we've been here a bit longer and started work, we'll get to know tons of folk. We'll be sick of the bloody buggers before long. Suit yourself, says Lisa. Listen, love, it's not that I don't want to make an effort. I just don't feel very sociable at the moment. Some other time, maybe. Yeah, okay. I understand. Stuart, Sarah and Oliver get up from their table and make their way out of the canteen. As they leave, Gary watches them closely. Stuart looks back over his shoulder. On seeing Gary watching him, he smiles and nods. Gary nods back. Right, shall we make a move? asks Lisa. We have to be back in the bus shortly. To be honest, love, I've got a banging headache, says Gary. Oh, well, maybe we should go to that medical place, see if we can get you some painkillers. I actually packed some in my bag for the journey here. I think I'm just going to head back to the apartment and have a lie down for an hour. That usually does the trick. Oh, well, we'll come back with you. No, oh, don't be silly, love. There's nothing to do back there. And you all need something to take your minds off things. You lot finish the tour, and I'll head back for a lie down. After an hour or two of shut-eye, I'll be back to my old self. Well, if you're sure. Positive. Enjoy the tour. I'll see you all later on, says Gary, and he gets up from the table. Okay, see ya. Bye, says Ben as Gary leaves. Well... Shall we make a move, you lot? asks Lisa. On the ground floor walkway, Gary is making his way through the crowds of people. Ahead of him, Stuart is strolling along with Sarah and Oliver. They stop and begin to chat. Gary crouches down and pretends to tie his shoelace while keeping a close eye on Stuart. After a moment, Stuart kisses Sarah on the cheek and then walks across to the lift. He gets in, and the door slides shut. On the ninth floor, the lift doors open and Gary steps out. He looks along the corridor. In the distance, Stuart is entering one of the apartments. On the shuttle bus, Lisa, Charlotte, Ben and Evie are sitting next to a man in his forties named Edward. I've been here almost two weeks, and I'm still noticing new things every day, he says. We just got here yesterday, says Lisa. Everything's all still very new and exciting for us. It's amazing, isn't it? 
I mean, I've been working with 3D models of this place every day for the past five or six years, but to experience it for real and see it working like this with my own eyes is absolutely astonishing. I'm an architect, by the way, if you hadn't already guessed. Oh, wow, says Lisa, clearly impressed. So you designed this place? Well, I was the lead architect on a team that designed the structure. I can't take all the credit. What did you do? You mean in the real world? Lisa asks. Yeah, to get in here. Oh, we were selected by the lottery. Oh, really? Says Edward, pleasantly surprised. Yeah, I did clerical work. My husband's here too. He used to be a mechanic in the army. Well, congratulations. I'm sure those skills will be put to good use. I hope so. We want to do our bit. You know, you're the first people I've met from the lottery. Well, I don't suppose there's many of us. I'm kind of relieved to tell you the truth, says Edward. My friend and I were coming up with all kinds of crazy conspiracy theories. What about? Lisa asks. About the government staging the lottery to prevent some kind of revolution. It all sounds very silly now, Edward says, laughing to himself. Oh well. Congratulations and welcome aboard. Lisa smiles. In the shop, the shelves are stocked with luxury foodstuffs such as chocolate, coffee, sugar and alcohol. Lisa, Charlotte, Ben and Evie are browsing the items on display. How many credits do we have each? Charlotte asks. Two, Lisa replies. Charlotte picks up a bar of chocolate. Can I get this? It's two credits. Yeah, of course you can. Can I get a beer? Asks Ben. Yeah, says Lisa, as long as it's non-alcoholic. Oh, Mum! Don't owe Mum me. You can get a beer when you're old enough to drink it. But we'll be out of here by then. Oh yeah, so we will, says Lisa with a grin. At the automated checkout, Charlotte scans her bar of chocolate. The digital display reads, One times chocolate bar, small, two credits. Charlotte presses her thumb against the sensor. There's a beep, and the digital display changes to read, Transaction complete. Thank you. On level nine, Gary is leaning on the railings, looking down at the people far below. Further up the corridor, an apartment door opens and Stuart steps out, pulling the door closed behind him. Gary notices and looks discreetly around as Stuart begins to approach. All right there, says Gary. Stuart, isn't it? Yes, says Stuart as he stops to chat. Nice to see you again, Michael. Are you on this floor too? Yeah, a bit further along. I'm just waiting for the kids. You know what they're like. Stuart smiles and nods. I was going to come over in the canteen and say hello, says Stuart, but it just didn't feel like the appropriate time. Your family looked quite upset. Yeah, it hit the girls hard. I suppose we all knew it was coming, but I think seeing it on the big screens like that really brought it home for everyone, myself included. Yes, it really shook up Sarah and Oliver too, there's a moment of silence. You know, says Stuart, there's actually something I think you can help me with. Oh yeah? What's that? Gary asks. I've been racking my brains, trying to remember the name of the infrastructure project manager. You must have worked with him closely. I remember his surname was Gunnell. Now, was it John or James? John. John Gunnell, Gary replies confidently. Stuart nods. That's what I thought. Excuse me. Stuart turns his back to Gary and continues to walk away down the corridor. You know, Gary says loudly, you have a lovely family. Stuart stops in his tracks. He slowly turns around to face Gary. Don't you dare threaten my family, he says angrily. Oh, it was no threat, pal. I'm just making an observation. There's nothing more important than family. Wouldn't you agree? Stuart doesn't respond. He just turns his back and continues to walk away.
Gary hastily walks after him and grabs Stuart by the arm. You're not going anywhere, pal. Not until we've come to an understanding. Get your hands off me, commands Stuart, trying to pull free from Gary's grip. But Gary holds on tight, and the two men begin to tussle. Stuart pushes Gary up against the wall. Gary shoves back hard, throwing Stuart into the railings. The top beam breaks, and Stuart loses his balance. Gary lunges forward quickly to grab him, but it's too late. Stuart topples over the edge. After a brief moment, distant screams echo from below. Gary peers over the broken railing. Nine floors down, there's a group of people gathering around Stuart's body. Oh, fuck. Fuck me, Gary says to himself, panicking. He looks around and then runs off down the corridor. Lisa, Charlotte, Ben and Evie are approaching the shuttle bus. What's going on up there? asks Charlotte, pointing to a large gathering of people further up the walkway. Don't know, says Lisa. Looks like there's some kind of commotion. Do you want to have a quick nosy? We've got a few minutes. Sure, says Charlotte, and together they approach the gathering of people ahead. It looks like there's been some kind of accident, says Charlotte, as she and Lisa try to peer over the shoulders of the onlookers. In the centre of the group, Sarah and Oliver are kneeling on the floor next to Stuart's lifeless body, which lies awkwardly in a pool of blood. Lisa gasps and turns away quickly. What is it, Mum? asks Ben. Nothing, pet. I think somebody's just collapsed, that's all. Come on, move out of the way. Let's give them some space, Lisa says, and she ushers Ben and Evie to the side. Mum, was that the man we saw in the canteen? Charlotte asks. I'm not sure, love. What's happened to him? asks Ben. I don't know, Lisa replies. He's probably just fainted. I'm sure he'll be fine. I think I read about this in the welcome pack. Something to do with the depth we're at. It can make some people feel faint and nauseated. It can take a while for them to adjust. A siren sounds as an ambulance approaches. People quickly move out of the way to let it through. Charlotte, will you take these two back to the bus, please? Asks Lisa. Why? Where are you going? I'm just going to go back to the apartment and check on your dad. See if he needs anything. We'll come with you. No, pet. You lot finish the tour. You'll be seeing where you're going to go to school. I'll come back down shortly and wait for you at the drop-off point. Mum, please don't, Charlotte pleads. I'll be fine. Now go on. The bus will be setting off soon. Charlotte holds out her hand to Evie. Come on, Eves, she says. Mum, I want to stay with you, Evie protests to Lisa. No, you go with your sister, pet. She'll look after you. Evie reluctantly takes Charlotte's hand. Ben, come on, says Charlotte as she leads Evie back towards the shuttle bus. As the three of them walk away, Charlotte glances back over her shoulder at Lisa. In the security office, the security manager stands behind the video technician who's seated at his desk, playing back footage from the surveillance cameras. So it looks like this guy follows the victim to his apartment and waits outside for about five minutes, explains the technician. Then the victim comes out. They exchange words. It looks friendly at first, but then it gets a bit heated. They start to fight, and he pushes the guy into the railings. The top railing breaks, and the guy goes over. For what it's worth, it looks like an accident. But then the guy panics and runs off down the corridor. Where did he go? the manager asks. Not entirely sure. I can follow him until he reaches the ground floor, but then he disappears into the crowd. The lights in the room momentarily flicker on and off. What was that? asks the manager. Don't know. They must be having teething problems. I lost power to the network storage this morning. The UPS kicked in, so we didn't lose anything, fortunately. Okay, good work. Try to locate this guy. I'll get his picture out to the guards. In the apartment, Lisa's sitting on the sofa by herself, holding the family's passports. Her eyes are red. She's obviously been crying. The apartment door opens and Gary walks in. Hiya, love, he says, closing the door behind him. What are you doing back already? 
Where are the kids? Gary, what have you done? Lisa asks. What do you mean? Don't treat me like an idiot. Lise, you're going to have to elaborate. I don't know what you're talking about. Why do our passports have other people's names on them? Lisa asks, throwing them at Gary. We didn't get selected by the lottery, did we? Gary doesn't respond. Did we? Lisa screams. No, Gary eventually replies, shaking his head shamefully. Oh God, I knew it. Who are these people, Gary? What did you do to them? Lise, I was going to tell you everything. I just wanted to make sure we got in. Then I was going to tell you everything. I swear. Gary, what did you do to those people? That's how you got the scratch, isn't it? You killed them. No, I didn't. I swear. I just tied them up. I arranged for somebody to go round to the house. They'll find them soon. Gary, we're in here, not them. You've killed them. And the bloke from the canteen? You did that too, didn't you? Please, that was an accident, I swear to God. I just wanted to warn him off, make sure he kept his mouth shut. He started to fight. I just pushed him to get him off me. I didn't intend him to go over. What were you thinking? How did you ever expect to get away with this? I didn't. I honestly didn't think we'd even get this far. But once it started, I had to keep going. One thing just led to another. All I wanted was to get you and the kids down here where you'd be safe. I didn't care what happened to me after that. Please, I did it for you and the kids. Don't you dare say you did it for us. I'd rather we were left on top. You would have died. You know that. Yeah, as good people. Now we have to live down here as murderers. No, I'll confess everything. I'll tell them you and the kids had nothing to do with it. And who will believe that? I can't even believe you pulled the wool over my eyes. Charlotte knew there was something funny about all this, but I convinced her and myself that everything was fine. I can't believe I've been so stupid. Lisa stands up and walks towards Gary. You've involved us, Gary. We're accomplices. There's blood on our hands, not just yours. She starts punching Gary. He doesn't retaliate. He just shields himself with his arms. You've killed people. Good people who deserve to be in here. You've made us into murderers. Your kids as well. Suddenly, there's a knock on the apartment door. Lisa stops and wipes the tears from her eyes. She and Gary just listen for a moment, not knowing what to do. There's another knock. Who is it? Gary eventually asks. Police, a voice replies. Open up. In the lift, Charlotte, Ben and Evie watch the floor numbers go up on the digital display. I wonder where Mum is, says Ben. She said she'd meet us at the drop-off point. She probably just lost track of time, Charlotte replies. All of a sudden, the lift stops moving and the lights go out. What's happening? asks Evie, clearly frightened. It's okay, Eves. Don't panic, Charlotte replies. Ben, search around for a button to press. What kind of button? I don't know. There must be some kind of emergency help button. Feel around the walls. As Ben begins to feel around with his hands, the lights flicker back on and the lift starts moving again. What did you press? asks Charlotte. Nothing, Ben replies. The lift stops at floor 12 and the doors slide open. Charlotte, Ben and Evie step out. They begin to walk along the corridor towards the apartment. Imagine if we got stuck in there, says Ben. I'd climb out the hatch in the ceiling and then climb up the steel ropes until I got to the next floor. Then I'd pull the doors open and... Look, says Charlotte. Ahead of them, three police officers are escorting Gary out of their apartment. His hands are cuffed behind his back. The kids stop still in their tracks and watch as Gary is led towards them. Dad, where are they taking you? asks Ben. Sorry, kids, Gary says as he's escorted past. Charlotte picks up Evie and begins to run up the corridor. Ben follows and together they burst into the apartment where Lisa's sitting on the sofa in floods of tears. Mum, what's happened? Are you okay? Charlotte asks. Where are they taking Dad? asks Ben. Lisa holds out her arms. Come here, she says. Charlotte, Ben and Evie sit down on the sofa with Lisa. 
and she hugs them all tightly. In the power room, a supervisor stands over an electrical engineer who sits at his desk looking at charts on his monitor. We've identified the fault to be a loose connection in the primary turbine, the engineer says. It's currently running at about 20% of full capacity, and we're losing power all the time. The UPS kicked in a couple of hours ago, so that's picking up the slack. But we only have about five hours charge on that. That leaves us with about three to go. Then what? asks the supervisor. Then we're out of power. The lighting, the heating, the water, the ventilation, all stops. How the hell can this be? How can all vital systems be dependent upon a single generator? There's actually three. Two should run concurrently at all times, but all the delays meant the other two weren't finished on time. We're still working on them now. Well, can't one of them be put online just as a temporary measure? Impossible. We've been working on them day and night, and we still need at least another week to get one operable. Jesus. So what are our options? Can we open the bunker? Well, that's not my call, but I'd guess not. Even if the effects of the eruption haven't reached us yet, we don't have the military personnel anymore to prevent a breach. Who knows how long they'd take to get back here. Okay, let's go back a step. Can we fix the main turbine? In theory, yes, but it means sending somebody into the turbine itself. So, what are we waiting for? It's not that simple. We can't turn it off. The UPS won't have enough juice to last long on its own, and it certainly wouldn't be able to restart the turbine from a dead rest. That means, with the turbine operating as it is, we've got a chance of getting somebody far enough down to fix the connection. But when the turbine's running normally again, we've got virtually no chance of getting them back out in one piece, even if we can put the brakes on. I mean, it might be possible, but it hasn't been tried. My gut feeling is that the uplift would suck them into the blades before we could do anything. Do you want to give that order? Fucking hell. Start shutting down systems. Lose anything that's non-essential. Buy us some time. In the centre of the interrogation room, Gary's sitting alone at the table with his head in his hands. You stupid bloody idiot. What the hell have you done? He asks himself as a tear rolls down his cheek. The door opens. Gary quickly sits up straight, wiping the tears from his eyes as Detective Rooney enters. Rooney closes the door and sits down at the table opposite Gary, laying an open file onto the tabletop. I'm Detective Rooney, he says. And you are? Gary clears his throat. Graham. Gary Graham. Your thumb scans say your name is Michael Robertson. Do you want to explain why? That's the bloke who should be down here, Gary replies, just as the ceiling lights go out and dim emergency lights flicker on. Gary looks around. Don't worry about the lights, says Rooney. They'll come back on again soon. It's been happening all afternoon. Please continue. Just as Gary is about to continue, there's a knock on the door and a junior officer enters. Sorry to interrupt, sir. I've been sent to guard the prisoner. The chief wants to see you in his office straight away. Why, what is it? asks Rooney. I'm not entirely sure, sir. They're bringing in all available personnel for an emergency briefing. Excuse me, Rooney says to Gary as he gets up from the table. I'll go and see what this is all about. I'll be back shortly. Rooney leaves the room. The junior officer closes the door and stands guard next to it. There's a moment of silence. So what's happening, kid? Gary eventually asks. The officer doesn't respond. He just stares straight ahead, avoiding eye contact with Gary. You must have heard something on the grapevine. It's to do with the power, isn't it? The officer still doesn't respond. Come on, you can tell me. It's not like I'm going anywhere. What you heard? The ground floor walkways are bustling with people. Suddenly the lights go out and dim emergency lights flicker on. Everyone stops in their tracks. They look around, clearly concerned. 
The PA system makes a hum as it switches on. Please do not be alarmed, a voice announces. We are currently undergoing essential maintenance work. Full power will be restored as soon as possible. The apartment is dimly illuminated. Lisa's cuddling Ben and Evie on the sofa. Charlotte's in the kitchen area, making cups of tea when the light on the water boiler goes out. The boiler's gone off now, she says. Don't worry, love, Lisa replies. I'm sure things will be back on again soon. Come and sit here with us. Suddenly, there's a loud knock on the apartment door. Lisa gets up quickly. She runs across to the door and opens it to reveal a police officer. This is Graham, he asks. In the police station, a female officer leads Lisa, Charlotte, Ben and Evie into a waiting room. Please take a seat, she says to Lisa. Your husband will be through shortly. Thank you, says Lisa. The police officer leaves and the family sit down at the table. A moment later, the door opens and Detective Rooney escorts Gary in. Dad! Ben yells. All right there, kid, says Gary as Rooney unlocks his handcuffs. I'll give you a moment alone, says Rooney. Cheers, Gary replies, rubbing his wrists. Rooney leaves the room and closes the door behind him. Ben runs across to Gary and gives him a hug. It's not true, is it? What they're saying? You're not going to do it, are you? He asks. Sit down, kid. Let's have a chat. Come on, hun. Sit down here, says Lisa. Let your dad speak. Ben takes his seat again at the table. Gary sits down at the table too. It's been a bit of a crazy day, hasn't it? He says. They can't make you do it, you know, says Charlotte, no matter what you've done. I know they can't, pet. I know they can't. I volunteered. Why? asks Ben. I've done some terrible things. For us, Dad. You did them for us. There's no excuses, kid. What are the chances you'll make it back? asks Lisa. You know me, Lise. I'm a survivor. You might die, exclaimed Ben. We'll all die if this turbine isn't fixed. Somebody else can do it. Yeah, they might. But it'll be somebody else's dad or brother or daughter. Listen, kid, I know it's hard to understand, but I won't be able to live with myself if I don't do this. We all have to earn our place down here, right? Well, this is my chance. But what if you don't come back? Ben asks, clearly upset. What about us? Let's be honest. I've never been a good dad, have I? Or husband, for that matter. Yes, you have, says Ben. Gary shakes his head. I've never been around to look after you all like I should have been. Your mum's always done that. Well, this is my chance to do something right for a change. Are you sure you're not just making a rash decision? Asks Lisa. Probably, says Gary, but that's me. You know that better than anyone. Tell him, Mum, says Ben in desperation. I can't, love. It's your dad's decision, and it sounds to me like he's made up his mind. Do you want him to go? No, of course not, Lisa insists. Hey, don't be daft, kid, Gary says calmly. Your mum's right. Once I've made a decision, there's no changing my mind. I'm a stubborn old git. Charlotte stands up. She walks round to Gary and gives him a hug. There are tears rolling down her cheeks. Good luck, she says. Thanks, pet, says Gary, his voice breaking. Oh, look, you've got me going now. Gary wipes a tear from his eye. The waiting room door opens and Detective Rooney enters. I'm sorry to interrupt, he says to Gary, but we don't have much time. We need to get you briefed and kitted out. Yeah, of course, Gary replies as he stands up from the table. Dad, don't go, please, Ben pleads. I have to, kid. We all love you, you know that, says Lisa. Hey, you're talking like you're never going to see me again. I'll be back before you know it. You better. Come here. Lisa says as she stands up and kisses Gary on the lips. Good luck. I want you back in one piece or there'll be hell to pay. Yes, ma'am, says Gary with a salute. 
He walks towards the door. Dad, Ben shouts. Gary looks back. Sorry, kid, he says. Lisa wipes the tears from her eyes. Gary looks at her. Please, when the power comes back, put the kettle on. I'll need a good cuppa. We will, she replies with a smile. In the power room, the electrical engineer is fastening up Gary's safety suit. The air temperature won't be too high now, the engineer says, but some of the components might still be a bit too hot to touch with your bare hands due to the electrical current, so keep your suit fastened and gloves on at all times. He fastens a headset onto Gary. This has a light so you can see what you're doing. There's also a camera so we can see what you're doing too. We'll be able to speak to you and you can speak to us. What about tools? Gary asks. You won't need any. It's plug and play. So, what will it be like? And the turbine? The engineer asks. You know, worst case scenario. Quick, the engineer says. Gary nods. In the turbine hall, the masses of electrical equipment makes a loud hum. At the centre of it all towers a gigantic turbine, about the size of a five-storey building. Workers in blue overalls stop and watch as Rooney escorts Gary through. One of the workers nods. Gary nods back. At the foot of the turbine is a lift that looks more like a human-sized bird cage. A mechanic is waiting inside for Rooney and Gary to board. When they do, he slides the door shut and sets the lift into motion. As they slowly rise, Gary peers down, nervously, at the people watching from far below. Once at the top, the mechanic opens the door, and the three men walk out onto a narrow platform. Follow me, the mechanic says loudly, so that he can be heard over the drone of the turbine. This is where you and I part ways, Rooney says to Gary, holding out his hand. Good luck to you. Yeah, cheers says Gary, as he grasps Rooney's hand and shakes it firmly. OK, Gary says, giving the mechanic a nod. Let's get this over with. The mechanic takes Gary over to a metal ladder that leads down into the mouth of the turbine. I'm just going to hook you up to a safety rope, he says, and he clips a rope onto Gary's harness. You can keep this on for the descent, but you'll have to unclip it to get past the blades. Gary nods to show his understanding. OK, watch your footing as you get on. Gary carefully climbs out into position, holding on to the ladder tightly. He looks down at the massive set of blades that whir around slowly, far below. Beads of sweat roll down his brow, and he wipes them with his sleeve. You OK? asks the mechanic. I'm absolutely shitting myself, Gary replies. But apart from that, I'm fine. The engineer will be talking to you the whole time, the mechanic says, holding out his hand to Gary. Thank you for doing this. No problem, Gary replies, shaking the man's hand. Now, whenever you're ready, the mechanic says, giving Gary the okay to proceed. Right, well, here goes. Gary begins to slowly climb down into the mouth of the turbine, being careful not to lose his footing. He climbs down several metres to where the ladder ends, and he steps off onto a small ledge. OK, the engineer says over Gary's headset. This is where you'll need to lose the rope. Gary unclips the rope from his harness. Done, he confirms. Now, there's another ledge about two metres below the first set of blades, You'll have to pick your time and drop down. Gary looks down at the ledge below. The enormous blades whir around slowly just beneath his feet. Gary edges into position. He waits for the right moment to jump and then drops down through the blades onto the ledge. He lands hard on his stomach. Excellent, the engineer says. Just three more to go. Fucking hell, Gary replies. The usually bright and busy walkways are eerily dim and quiet. People huddle together in small groups to conserve body heat. Their breath condenses in the cold air. Police officers hand out insulation blankets to whoever needs them. A man looks up at one of the television screens where a message reads, 
We are currently performing essential maintenance work. Full power will be restored as soon as possible. In the police station waiting room, Lisa, Charlotte, Ben and Evie are sitting huddled together underneath a thick blanket. Their eyes are red. They've obviously all been crying. I'm freezing, says Ben. I know, love. We all are, replies Lisa. We just need to keep huddled together like this. I wonder how he's doing, says Charlotte. He'll be fine, Lisa replies reassuringly. He always is. Your dad fixed tanks in war-torn Iraq. This should be a piece of cake. In the turbine, Gary falls through the last set of blades and lands hard on the metal floor. He gets to his feet and looks up at the four massive propellers slowly whirring around above him. Are you okay? asks the engineer over Gary's headset. Actually, I was just thinking, is it too late to change my mind? Gary asks wryly. Of course not, providing you can climb back up. Gary smiles. So, what do I need to do? he asks. Okay, now look down at the floor. Do you see the access panel? Yeah. You need to open it up, turn the handle anti-clockwise and then pull. Gary kneels down and opens the access panel as instructed. Now, the engineer continues, inside you'll see a lot of wiring. To your left, you'll see the three larger cables. One's blue, one's green and one's yellow. Yeah, I can see them, Gary confirms. Is the yellow cable loose? Gary reaches down and gently tugs at the yellow cable. One end of it immediately comes away in his hand. I'll take that as a yes. You need to plug the end of that cable firmly into its socket. Hang on. When I plug this in, are we back to full power? Yes, but I'll slow down the blades as much as I can. Gary looks at the empty socket. Beads of sweat roll down his face. Listen, he says. If I don't get out of here, can you do me a favour? What is it? Can you tell the bloke's wife and kid that I'm sorry? It was an accident. And can you tell my family that I was thinking about them? You know, at the end. Yes, of course. Okay then, here goes. If I don't make it out, good luck in the future. Gary plugs the yellow cable firmly into the socket. The blades above him start spinning quickly. He slams the access panel shut before the sudden uplift sucks him into the air. In the police station, the main lighting begins to flicker back on. Lisa, Charlotte, Ben and Evie look around. He's done it, says Charlotte. Lisa forces a smile. Yeah, pet. Yeah, he has. A tear rolls down her cheek. The lights also flicker back on in the main walkways. The people huddled under blankets begin to clap and cheer. In the turbine hall, the workers celebrate excitedly, while Detective Rooney slowly applauds. In the power room, the electrical engineer takes off his headset and lays it on the desk. He sits for a moment before the supervisor approaches. Good job, he says, patting the engineer on the shoulder. The engineer slowly nods in agreement. In the police station, Lisa, Charlotte, Ben and Evie are still huddled together under the blanket. They just sit quietly and listen to the faint cheering. Five years later. The sky is blue with a few wispy white clouds. The landscape is still and barren. The huge steel doors in the rock face slowly open and people begin to file out, whooping and cheering in excited celebration. Among them are Lisa, Charlotte, Ben and Evie. Well, you lot, we made it, says Lisa. A bird circles up high in the sky. Look, Evie says, pointing excitedly. I wish Dad could see this, says Ben. Lisa puts her arm around his shoulders. How do you know he's not watching us all right now? She asks, saying, well done, kid. You made it. I think he is, says Charlotte. Me too, says Lisa. 
Me three, says Evie. Me four, says Ben. Well then, it's unanimous, says Lisa. So, what do you say? Let's make him proud. Ben smiles and nods. Hundreds more people continue to file out of the bunkers. On the bare and sandy earth beneath their feet, new shoots are beginning to grow. On one of the shoots, a single bud is beginning to open into a purple flower. The End